Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Well, dealing with false conversions, the most essential passage of Scripture tells us you will know them by their fruits. If you do not see the fruit of the Spirit in a person's life at all, not that we're not all deficient in the fruit of the Spirit, but if you do not see a radical change in the person's life and lifestyle, certainly in the areas of morality, but also in the areas of the fruit of the Spirit in their life, in some way, to some degree, that will be visible, that is a sign of a false conversion. Secondly, when you see people who make the commitment on the basis of cheap grace to just put their hand up at a meeting or something without fully understanding the commitment, this goes back to the parable of the sower and the seed. When the bird, that is the demons, will just take what's sown because it had no depth, it was not properly understood, or something else that happens, the thorns choke the new growth. The cares of the world almost implode upon the new believer. Those are the usual things that happen. Remember, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The most important things for a new believer is make sure, first of all, they really understand regeneration and substitutionary atonement. And be careful of people who are denying substitutionary atonement, that Jesus died for sin, such as that false teacher, William B. Young, who, who, who authored the shack. It's people deny substitutionary atonement. That is a formula for false conversion. The shack is a formula for false conversion. Another formula for false conversion is the purpose-driven lie by Rick Warren. Rick Warren tells people in his purpose-driven lie that uh, if you see a person living immorally or involved in substance abuse, don't tell them they need to repent. That's a negative message. We have to be positive. Just tell them they need Jesus in their life, and then he'll clean them up. Well, if somebody doesn't repent, Jesus isn't coming into their life. The apostles plainly said, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. John the Baptist, repent. The Hebrew prophets, repent. Jesus, repent and believe. If there's no repentance, it is for sure there's going to be a false conversion. Uh, when you see people who, again, profess to have been born again, but will not follow the teachings of Jesus and the New Testament, when they don't want to get baptized, or when they don't want to come to fellowship, or they don't want to witness and share their faith, those things are very often, in fact, usually indications also of a false conversion. What can you do about it? Make sure somebody understands the commitment. Don't go for numbers. Don't go for numbers baptized or how many people are coming to church. Remember, converts fall away. Only disciples remain. When you say people, particularly the televangelists, we had thousands saved, hallelujah. Where are they now? Jesus never said to make converts. He said to make disciples. Always remember, evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. There must be discipleship. At some point, it has to kick in, and usually the sooner the better. The first step of biblical discipleship was believer's baptism and getting that person into fellowship with other believers because Satan is going to surround them with unsaved people who are going to try to drag them away from Christ. Understand this. Now that is, of course, if somebody was really saved. But a false conversion will always happen when somebody does not understand the nature and depth of the commitment. Again, Rick Warren, just put your hand up or just ask Jesus into your life. These things are, again, absolute invitations to false conversion. They're not invitations to receive Christ. They're invitations 
the false conversion. Remember also that Jesus told the religious leaders of his day that they go to the ends of the earth to make one proselyte, one convert, and he becomes twice as much a son of hell as he used to be. When somebody is saved and they go into a bad church, that bad church is going to corrupt them. They need to be fed the finest of wheat. They need to be fed the pure milk of the word as new believers also. These are essential things. Um, Billy Graham admits that only a percentage of the people who come forth at his crusades have really been truly committed and continued following him. He reckons it's less than 10%, to the best of my understanding. Now, of course, given the size of his crusades, that would still be a lot of people over the years. But of all those people who come forward, if you come back 10 years later, fewer than 10% are still walking with Jesus and have a radical change in their life. This is not good. People must understand the seriousness of the commitment of what Jesus did for them and what the cost is. Getting born again is the biggest decision of someone's life. It's a bigger decision than life or death surgery. It's a bigger decision than marriage. It's a bigger decision than anything. They must understand what they are doing. And they must understand that Christ made a commitment for them on the cross. He expects a commitment from them to pick up their cross and follow him. And Jacob, it, that brings it, up another concern, another concern about, about you know, I'm not family. saying a young child couldn't be saved, but it's very concerning that a young child who, who may like Jesus or see him as a hero really has the, uh, the knowledge to understand what's, what's happening. You know, the gospel is actually intellectually very simple. There are children who are at a young age, perhaps six or something like that, can really understand that Jesus died in their place for their sin and that he rose from the dead to give them eternal life. And he wants them to trust him and follow him and he's going to put his spirit in them to empower them to do it. There are children who are young, six and things like this, who can understand that commitment as long as it's properly explained to them. Now, something happens very often with children of believers. People like myself, possibly yourself, had a crisis point conversion. You reach a point in your life where you make that commitment, you accept Christ, okay? When you grow up believing in a family of believers where your parents are Christians, and they take you to church and to Sunday school, and they tell you bedtime stories from the Bible, Sometimes those children come to know Jesus on their own without having a crisis point or saying the sinner's prayer. They're just saying their bedtime prayers or something. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. God bless mommy and daddy. They can come to a realization of who he is by the Holy Spirit. There may not be a specific point or date that you can put your finger on in the case where you have the children of believers. Or particularly. But what you can put your finger on is the date of their baptism. Remember, Scripture does not separate regeneration from baptism. What do you do with a corpse? You bury it and resurrect it again. Uh, be careful of churches, evangelists, and ministries who downplay the importance of believers' baptism and who separate baptism from salvation. On the other hand, be co-equally careful of sacramentalism, not just the Roman Catholic version, which teaches baptismal regeneration and ex opere operato power of the ritual itself to save a baby based on the faith of its parents and godparents. This is ridiculous. But uh, the Protestant version, the Campbellites, the Church of Christ, um, who say it's not enough to pray to be born again, you also have to be baptized by immersion in water to be saved. And some of them even say, you must be baptized in water in their church, which is known as the sin of party spirit. Be very careful of that. The good thief did not have an opportunity, as we call him the good thief, did not have an opportunity to get baptized, but Jesus told him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. However, 
if somebody does have the opportunity to be baptized and doesn't do it, that raises the question, were they truly saved?